This man's name is Nick McCrados. Destination, Munich. Occupation, freelance journalist, door-to-door -door salesman, jack of all trades, with no particular skill in any. But in Vienna, his last stop in a search of fortune, McCrados made a contact that promises to open for him a whole new career. name is Tomoko Kimura. Occupation, taxi dancer in Tokyo's music hall, a favorite night spot of American servicemen. Lately, having struck up an acquaintance with a U.S. Marine, Tomoko has made his service club her afternoon hangout. This is Janos, a national of a European country. His destination, an American air base overseas. His jade cufflinks aren't just accidental attire. parts of the world, but all with a common mission, for each is a hostile agent of the worldwide Sino-Soviet intelligence network. Pardon, sir. Could I trouble you for a match? Their job? To exploit, if and when the opportunity arises, you a serviceman and woman, in order to gain access to information that can be of value to an enemy. from the files of the Army Intelligence Corps, the Office of Special Investigation, U.S. Air Force, and the Office of Naval Intelligence. Today, we're going to show you three cases of attempted espionage by agents of the Sino-Soviet intelligence system. Now, for security reasons, certain names and locations have been altered. But essentially, these things happen. They are typical case histories. Now, as these cases unfold, you'll recognize the way a Sino or Soviet agent operates both in finding someone vulnerable to subversion, as well as in their technique of ensnaring him, then applying pressure to get him to play ball. Now, we show you these cases so you'll be on your guard. Today, all over the world, there are thousands of Sino-Soviet intelligence agents with money to burn, looking for unsuspecting targets for exploitation among members of our forces. There may be someone right now taking your measure, probing for a vulnerable area, whether it be loneliness, indebtedness, desire for sex, easy money, or the sporting life. In fact, everyone in uniform could be a target of opportunity for exploitation if he is vulnerable. Profit from these cases. Learn how to recognize the approach of an enemy agent, and if ever approached, what to do. Remember, these things happened. They may never happen to you, then again they may. 
First, the case of Nick McCrados. Arriving in Munich, McCrados, recruited in Vienna by a task representative, joined the ranks of the 16,000 communist agents operating in the Republic of West Germany. Weekends, American servicemen from Augsburg, where a contingent of the 7th Army was stationed, crowded the Schwabing district of Munich, looking for a good time. This became McCrado's stamping ground as he waited for his pigeons to show up. He had already made contact with PFC Templeton and Private Karras some time before. May I take care of that, fellows? McCrados had bided his time while Pete Karras found his new bar acquaintance a highly likable and sociable chap, quick to pick up the tab, promising to introduce him to girls, also coming from the same ethnical background as Pete's own family. Finally, at this meeting, McCrado sprang the trap. I want you to do me a little favor. Really, there is nothing to it. I want to write an article about the Seventh Army for my newspaper back home. My country, you know, is very friendly to the United States. It's just routine stuff. I could get it by reading the Stars and Stripes from your own information officer, but it is too much trouble. So I am willing to pay you to save me from going all the way to Augsburg. PFC Templeton wasn't one to turn down a fast buck. A lone shark in his barracks, because his partner had suddenly pulled out, he was head over heels in debt. How much? Well, how much would you say? 200 marks. OK, it is agreed. Hey, Pete. Now let's have another round. Fraulein. More drinks for my friends, if you will. Fine, Pete. A small formality, Pete, if you'll just sign this receipt. That just says for services rendered. We know what it's for. Come, Pete, the girls are waiting. Pete Karras was hooked, though as yet he didn't know it. In the next few weeks, for payment received, the two servicemen delivered to their benefactor several other apparently harmless items of information, including a classified training manual. But McCrados had bigger fish to fry. Fraulein. Drinks for my two friends, please. Beer. Beer. Where is Pete? Bedroom. Pete? Why don't you leave us alone? Pete, the house. Pete, you must get me an M14 rifle. You must be off your rocker. I have just come from a friend. He has a great admiration for this gun. He is willing to pay high. You must be putting me on. McCrados. How high? 2,000 marks. Can you arrange? Why would McCrados pay $500 for a rifle he could buy for one-fifth of that amount? But if Templeton had one principle, it was never look a gift horse in the mouth. We'll arrange. Tam! Good. I'll tell my friend. Let me know when you can deliver, Private. You know where to find me. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. We're both in too deep to renege now. In a way, the private was right. For McCrados had been careful to get his signature to the last receipt. McCrados is a good egg. He won't get us into trouble. As long as he keeps shelling out the dough, I say here's to McCrados. the job, Templeton had recruited another member to the ring, a serviceman deep in hock to him.
the next few months, there were other mysterious losses from an arms room of Company B. All this by way of laying the groundwork for what the Soviet intelligence agent pulling the strings, the man behind Makratos, really wanted. Ah, uh, Herr Makratos, the gates. How is everything? Everything is fine. Won't you sit down? Herr Golos was one of a great number of Soviet intelligence agents who operate today under a legal cover. In his case, as a representative of the TASS International Newspaper Services. You are waiting for someone? Yes, I have two friends I must meet for lunch. Ah, then I wouldn't keep you. In fact, I have a lunch in appointment myself. Guten Tag, Herr Makredos. Macro. My friend is willing to pay high. Very, very high. It's impossible. There's sentries, fences. It'd be like trying to break into Fort Knox. How high, Macredos? Eight thousand dollars. Enough to split many ways. I've had it. Sit down, Pete. Who do you think you are? Never mind that. You'd better sit down. Pete, what would you say if your commanding officer were to receive a certain piece of paper with your signature? Pete, what he's saying is, we're hooked. And how? Give us time. It's a big job. Certainly. All the time you wish. In the next week, PFC Templeton cased the area where the special atomic weapon was stored. He also managed to strike up a friendship with one of the sentries. Meanwhile, Pete Karras was having some second thoughts. If he wasn't yet aware of his betrayal of his buddies, his family, and his country, he at least knew he'd got his neck in a noose that was drawing ever more tight. You're not cutting off, Karras. You're in this all the way. You try any monkey shine, Sonny, and I swear him. However, by the time Templeton had things well in hand, the plot had been reported by Karras to his CO. The grab was made the day Macredos appeared at Helga's apartment to make a down payment on the deal. When the servicemen were later court-martialed, because of his last-minute confession, Karras was to receive a lighter sentence than the others. On the other hand, Templeton, along with a dishonorable discharge and loss of all benefits, received 10 years at hard labor, plus a stigma he would bear the rest of his life. As for Macredos, he was to be tried under the espionage laws of the Federated Republic of West Germany. In one year alone, more than 2,000 communist agents were caught in West Germany. Now, between 1950 and 1960, more than 19,000 such agents confessed to espionage missions in that country. Let me show you something. This is the headquarters of MFS, the East German Ministry for State Security, located in East Berlin. From here, the MFS controls a network of trained and well-equipped agents operating in West Germany and elsewhere. It is really masterminded by the Soviets, who use it to their advantage and take the best information which it controls. It has ample funds, modern espionage equipment, and highly experienced staff officers. It has 22,000 staff officers and hundreds of millions of dollars to spend, all for one purpose, to buy information that could compromise our nation's security. Now, this is only one of several communist intelligence agencies. In another Iron Curtain country, there's another agency, just as dedicated as the East German MFS, which carries on espionage against us. In fact, Z2, the intelligence branch of the Polish Armed Forces, maintains a tremendous filing system called Kartotica Personalna, or Personal Index, 
on U.S. officers, especially those in high positions. A compilation of information on the officer's unit, his career, his family, and personal habits. Anything that might turn up an Achilles heel, a vulnerable spot that would make him a likely target of opportunity for exploitation. However, Z2's efforts to subvert members of our armed forces are by no means confined to officer personnel, as our second case will show. Not long ago, to Warsaw to visit her aged mother, came the wife of a U.S. Air Force sergeant. Desperate to get her parent out of the country, she was given the runaround until one day, Mrs. Duncan, born Baranowski, was summoned to the office of a Z2 official. Believe me, Mrs. Duncan, we are not unsympathetic. But, as you know, emigration is against the laws of our country. However, in uh, your case, I think it is possible to make an exception. In uh, return for, uh, shall we say, a small favor? From intercepted letters, from her visa application and from other sources, Z2 had a considerable dossier on Mrs. Duncan's husband, an airman stationed in a Middle Eastern country and who, because of his duties, had access to classified information. And so, if he cooperates, dear lady, in time your mother will join you. Talk it over with him. We will be in touch. Mrs. Duncan, upon return from Warsaw, discussed the situation with her husband. He reported to OSI, who instructed him to report any further contacts. Reassured by her husband, Christina Duncan had almost forgotten the incident. But on the third Monday after her return, just as the Z2 official had promised, she was contacted. Hello? Who? Where? All right. I'll be there. Just take it easy, honey. I'll handle it. Take over from me, Ed. I've got to see the commander. Christina Duncan delivered her first assignment to the Z2 agent, the meeting was under surveillance of OSI agents and local authorities who had prepared the information. Over the next few months, to a drop in an area frequented by tourists, Mrs. Duncan delivered other information prepared by OSI. The number and type of aircraft at the base, its facility charts, and other important looking but unclassified material. Finally, Mrs. Duncan's reward came. The day her mother, liberated from the Iron Curtain country, was able to join her daughter. The time had now come for apprehension of the Z2 hireling. Coached by OSI agents, Mrs. Duncan requested a meeting on the pretext of delivering an important message.
When she arrived at their meeting place, Janos did not have her wait long. Good morning, Mrs. Duncan. Quick, where is it? Janos was never able to transmit that information. For he was arrested and jailed under violation of local espionage laws, bringing to an end his career as an intelligence agent. A relative behind the Iron Curtain. Indebtedness, loneliness, the desire for an easy buck. All vulnerable areas ripe for exploitation. But there is yet a more common pressure point of the serviceman, seldom overlooked by the Sino-Soviet intelligence agent. And that brings us to our third case. Tomoko Kimura was no Mata Hari, but she had her value to her employer, a Sino-intelligence agent. Using sex as bait, she'd been able to elicit odds and ends of information concerning the goings-on of a technical representative for an American electronics firm. Her boyfriend, Corporal Bissell went about his duties comfortable in the knowledge that, upon his return, an appetizing dish would almost certainly be awaiting him. Here you are, buddy. Did you hear the latest? Got it through the grapevine. Scotty's out the corner of the black market. He's bought himself over 150 fifths of booze. Who does he think he's kidding? Why, that thieving little rascal. Who's Scotty? Johnny, who's Scotty? Huh? This man, Scotty, who is he? Oh, just some American tech crap over here on classified stuff. What's it to you, Demoko? Just wondered. Come on, Miss Nosy, we've more important things to do. Two days later, young Walter P. Scott, an American technical representative, inexperienced in Oriental ways and with access to classified material, received a message that it would be to his interest to dine that evening with a certain Mr. Kai. And so, my friend, for two cases of scotch, I would gladly pay what you are accustomed to receive. But why me? Oh, come now, Mr. Scott. I happen to know this is not a new experience for you. Got the wrong man, Mr. Kai. Mr. Scott. Your superiors would be most interested in my information. I assure you it is most reliable. Upon Scott's performance of the requested service, standard Sino-Soviet intelligence procedure followed, obtaining his signature to an unitemized receipt designed to pin him forever to a hook. In time, the pressure was applied on Scott to sell another type of service. This involved the theft of classified data so vital to his responsibility in Japan. But Scott, fully aware he was traveling a one-way road to treason, finally had the good sense and judgment to get off that one-way road and rush to see the security officer. An investigation was started immediately. Hey, Bissell. You got a minute? Well, sure, Top. Come in. Do you remember the day you told me about Scotty hoarding all that booze? Did you babble that to anyone else? Why, Tom? Ah, he's in a pack of trouble. So think hard, Corporal. Yeah, to Mike Wilson. I remember, Tomoko and her pal were there, too. Tomoko. You know, she kept asking me about it, wanted to know all about Scotty, kept after me for hours. It's probably our pipeline. Come on, we're gonna see the security officer.
The wrap-up of the case? The Chinese communist intelligence agent was apprehended in midst of receiving stolen material. That same day, the service club was declared off-limits to Tomoko Kimura. There are important lessons all of us can learn from these cases of attempted penetration of our nation's security. First, beware of the stranger you may meet at the bar or in the street who goes out of his way to cultivate you. The man who, like Nick Macrados, plies you with favors in order to win your friendship. It is just possible he may have something else in mind. Secondly, recognize the modus operandi of the hostile intelligence agent almost a standard pattern to lure the unsuspecting victim into a trap until, like Pete Karras, he is in so deep there seems no way out. Thirdly, and above all, if you suspect an approach by a communist agent, know what to do. Don't try to handle it yourself. Instead, stall for time and, like Sergeant Duncan, report the approach immediately to your CO or the nearest security officer. Almost daily, the espionage war being waged by the Sino-Soviet intelligence network grows more intense. Today, it is common knowledge that Soviet espionage agents are operating everywhere. Even the Soviet tourist may have an intelligence assignment. In addition, thousands of nationals of other countries are in the employ of this system. Remember, we cannot be too alert, for no one in uniform, sailor, soldier, airman, or marine, is immune to an approach by a member of this worldwide network. But each of us is responsible for safeguarding the security of our military forces. And so we repeat, if you are ever approached to perform even a seemingly harmless service having to do with your military duties, or know of another serviceman being involved in such an approach, report it at once to your CO or nearest security officer so that our counterintelligence forces may cope with this threat. Whatever you say will be held in strict confidence. By doing so, you'll be fulfilling service regulations. You'll be performing a patriotic service to your country. And you will be helping to keep information vital to the strength of our armed forces and our nation secure from penetration. Yeah.